three, be advised, we have a visual on enemy paratroopers. I don't know we're on to them. Request permission to engage with intent to conduct a smash. Over. Hitman 2-3, Echo 5, Fox Trust. This is Hitman 2 Actual. You are approved to engage in five mics. Welcome to Tactical Tuesday, the live podcast every Tuesday night hosted by Ghost Tactical, brought to you by GunChannels.com. Our podcasts are available on YouTube, GunChannels.com, Podbean, iTunes, and Stitcher. What is going on, my Ghost Squad? Welcome to Tactical Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, June 26, 2018. How is everybody doing? Today's going to be a great show. Uh, before we get going, I want to make a couple things out there. We are now up and live on Podbean. I've got uh, the last oh, 10 or 15 or so episodes of Tactical Tuesday uploaded on Podbean. It's also on iTunes, so if you're on iTunes, go and check us out over there as well. Uh, Stitcher is uploading it right now. Should be probably tomorrow or so. They said a couple days, so... Uh, we'll be on that as well. If you like to do the podcasting, if you're out driving around, you don't listen to the radio, we invite you to go check us out over there. Uh, the full catalog is also uploaded over on gunstreamer.com and the Utah Gun Exchange huge tube. So go check us out on all those places. We're trying to spread the gospel that is Ghost Tactical. As always, we are live on YouTube. We are also simulcasting, as always, on GunChannels.com. If you guys are fully aware of Gun Channels right by now, if not, I want to put a link out there on the YouTube side. Come check us out. We are uh, a great pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment community that G-Web started five or so years ago, and, and I want to thank him for everything that he does for the community. Guys, if you have any questions for guns or Second Amendment or anything, there are plenty of knowledgeable people over there on Gun Channels that you can... Uh, jump in our lobby chat. We've got going going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So come over there, check us out. We got some great shows over there. Most of your content creators and show hosts that you watch were on Gun Channels as well. So go check out Gun Channels. It's a great place. Uh, we've speaking of Gun Channels, let's go check out. We've got uh, Night Strike and DT Pfeiffer and the Pants and uh, Mister White's over there. On the YouTube side, we've got some interesting... Oh, you guys got a conversation about some scopes over there. you got Mohawk Boy, Midnight Range TMs over there. Patrick Pew Pew, Lead Life, talking about a Vortex Strike Eagle or a Nikon MTAC. Uh, both of them are good. Um, I have more... Uh, for me personally, I have more experience with the, uh, with the Nikon MTAC than the Strike Eagle. I probably have more experience with some Vortex, but not the Strike Eagle itself. But uh, both... Both companies are, are wonderful and have great reputations, so I don't think you can go wrong either way. Uh, let's see here. Who else is out there? D-Temps out there. Gun-loving Grandpa Stanley, Southpaw, MW Tactical. You're everywhere, my man. Rich White, the 1%. Georgia Truckers out there. So as they start to come in, we will uh, shout you out. If you're new to the chat, then welcome to uh, our channel and our chat. If you want to say something, go ahead and, and say it in the chat. Let us know you're out there, where you're from. If you have a question, go ahead and tag me in your question. If not, you can email it to live at ghosttactical.us, and we'll make sure we get those questions answered. JB is out there. Uh, let's run the uh, let's run through the room real quick, and we've got a, a really good panel tonight to discuss a couple cool things, but uh, we're going to give these guys some time to talk about some of the projects they have going on. We've got uh, from South Carolina, we've got Michael Woodland from MW Tactical. Mike, what's going on, my man? you got some stuff going on today, don't you? Oh, man, trying to stay busy. First oh, of man, all, I'm trying, trying to stay busy. busy. First, First of all, thank, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for having me on the show. But um, I'll Oh, you're welcome that. anytime. I love well, having you on. I'll sign with that. Yeah. I don't know what that kickback is. Is that for me? Yeah. I don't know what that kickback is. Is that for me? Um, I don't hear anything. Yeah, I'm getting like some reverb. But yeah, like I said, I don't know. but I'm here. Um, was out doing the guys, you guys to go. Let me know. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. you had the polling station today. So you were out there trying to get people to the polling stations, and the primary vote was today, correct? Correct. Well, in South Carolina, it was the runoff. So I don't know what it was in other places, but I just know I got this list. Of course, you know you do everything on the internet these days. Looked up and saw who was where, and I just wrote down everybody who was voting, like in Mississippi, Oklahoma. Utah, Colorado, Maryland, of course, South Carolina. 
put the word out, try to spread the message. Um, a lot of people didn't know. Now you do know, so there's no excuse. There you go. And uh, I know that you've got some really cool projects you got working on. You're doing a great job being a part of your community. Uh, I know that the uh, fundraiser for the jujitsu training for the local sheriffs is going well. Uh, do you want to give an update on that? Do you have an update on that? Oh, yeah, we have an update on that. Um, right now, we raised um, $892 out of the 10000 that we need. Um, we was looking for three sheriffs. Now we have all three sheriffs slotted, ready to go. So now we just need the donations to come in so we can make this community effort work as one. Fantastic. Well, we're glad to have you and thank you for doing what you're doing in your community. It, it means a lot to everyone because, like I said, we talked off, off air that we all like to think we can make a difference in the YouTube and the gun community by putting out information, entertaining people, hopefully answering some questions, doing reviews and all that. But to make a difference in your hometown community and uh, be seen as a role model and inspiration. And, and oh, by the way, you're also a gun guy uh, is extremely important. So kudos to you. I appreciate that. Uh, oh, no problem, man. And from Flo Rida, the tactical troll daddy himself, uh, Kevin, the tack daddy is in the house. What's up, my man? What's up? Another Tuesday. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Good. Hey, I know that you had last week, uh, was it was a Friday or Saturday. You had, um, some stuff going on there in Parkland. And, uh, I don't know if you can talk about much of it or not. You put a couple of videos out there, some little snippets, but how did that go? And, uh, how was it received? It was good. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I had a couple teachers show up, about 12 people showed up total and talked for a couple hours about mindset, awareness, preparedness, that kind of stuff. I actually, um, I just put all those snippets together in one long video. So I'll have that drop probably tomorrow on the channel. If someone wants to check that out. But uh, good conversation awesome. about uh, stuff everyone should be paying attention to. Pretty much old hat stuff for most of the people on the uh, on the gun channel, view channel viewership side of things. Nice. But and... Um... But I'll shout out uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Tactical. I'll shout out Five Eleven Tactical and Taser for helping make that whole thing happen. There you go. Well, I hope. Is there going to be more of those maybe down the line, or, or what's up? Based on the feedback I got, I don't think I can stop. To be honest with you, um, kind of got to figure good. that out. But I, I'll probably run one back in the middle of July sometime. Okay. All right. Sounds good. We'll keep doing what you're doing, bro. And from Texas, the tactical leprechaun himself. What's up, Clover Tech? Hey, bud. Thanks for the invite. Good to be here. As always. You sound like you're in a peachy mood. You tired, man? I'm a little tired, yeah. You sound it. Yeah, that's all good. Well, before we get going, guys, as always, I'd like to do a couple of uh, public service announcements. So I am going to uh, get the first one going real quick. If you... Give me a second here. Hey, Ghost Squad, this is Sky. At Ghost Tactical, we understand the rising tensions across America regarding guns and gun control. It is more important than ever to be vigilant about our Second Amendment rights. We encourage everyone to stay informed and contact your local, state, and federally elected officials to make sure they are hearing your voice. They represent you, and without your input, their votes may be vulnerable to outside influences. We ask that you actively support any gun rights organizations such as Gun Owners of America, Second Amendment Foundation, Firearm Policy Coalition, and even the National Rifle Association. We understand you may not agree with all the politics involved with some of the organizations, but we encourage you to keep up with and support as many as you can. Well, there you go. And uh, thanks to my lovely daughter, Sky, for doing those for me. All right, before we get going into our main talk about training and, and practicing for concealed carry, home defense, and self-defense, I want to talk a little quick about something that happened yesterday that I thought was pretty cool. Um, it had been going on for years and years and years, but it stopped a little over 10 years ago when uh, Kim Jong-un took over power in North Korea. But uh, they, they used to kind of, when they found them, they would send some remains back of the American servicemen uh, from the Korean War. And it had stopped for a while, but 
thanks to the June 12th summit that Kim Jong had with Trump, they've decided to open that up back again. And yesterday, uh, the North Koreans sent, I believe the number was 158 uh, steel kind of crates and uh, sent them back uh, down over to America with uh, remains of American soldiers and servicemen and women from the Korean War. Uh, I was listening to G's chat last night on the Daily Gun Show, and I think uh, maybe Angelina brought up that there's over 7,700 MIA from the Korean War that are from that are American servicemen, and uh, it's nice to hear that maybe we're going to get some of those back. And they had over 100 coffins with the American flags draped on them, getting them ready to ship them home. So uh, last night in that chat, uh, I think Patriot in the Dark said it very, very beautifully. He said, "Welcome home." Uh, to our heroes, may you rest in eternal peace. And I know that the families of these heroes are probably glad to have them back, probably going to Arlington Cemetery. I imagine most of them would. Uh, if they can be identified by DNA, great. If not, they might be part of the uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So uh, welcome home to our heroes. And it's nice to see that so far, maybe Kim Jong-un is living up to at least part of his deal he made with Trump. Uh, Mike, I know you're a veteran and you guys in here have all to say, but um, it's always nice to hear that maybe there's some closure for our families that lost grandpas and all that and great grandfathers over in the Korean War that, you know, maybe it is a little bit closure to bring them home. But I just like the fact that they're being brought home. They're given their proper burial and uh, going to be celebrated as heroes. You guys uh, heard anything new about that? No, I haven't heard anything new um, in regards. I heard everything you heard, and I was actually shocked to hear that, um, that he is withstanding his end of the deal. But at the same time, I was always also wondering, how far do they go back as far as DNA? Because you remember when we first joined the military, they was taking DNA. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know. I'm assuming that... Uh, even back in the 50s, it was I think it was like, what, 50 to 53 was a Korean War, I, th I believe, 50 to 53, 54, somewhere in there. I would imagine that even back then, uh, they were at least taking blood samples. So I don't know how long they keep those for, but I would like to think that maybe they could be able to pull some DNA um, from the bones that are still left, possibly. And, you know, maybe set up a channel. I don't know how it's going to work, but maybe set up a channel through the families and saying, you know, if you have one of these people at MIA and you're a direct descendant of this person, maybe they can go in and get some blood drawn or whatever and maybe test DNA that way uh, to match it to some um, some bone marrow or something. I, I don't know how it would work. I would like to think that our technology today is is um, to the point where maybe we could at least identify some of these people. Yeah, I think um, um, I think um, they actually they actually come to that conclusion come to that conclusion have closure to the family so yeah yeah uh shout out to scotsman mad sexy's out there keith gregory black cat outdoors um i know i missed a few more that came in here um if i miss you i apologize zoro's out there um david bowling's out there so guys if you're out there and uh, you want to say, hey, go ahead and say something. We don't know that you're out in the chat until you say something. So, uh, Gizzard I'd Gary's like out. So, yeah, go for it, Kev. Kim, Kim Jong-il, you're not fooling me. I know about your reanimation project. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, the, At all due respect, yeah. I, did, I did think to myself, I was like, God, think about it. He held those bodies for like 50 years. Why in the world? Yeah. And now he's turning them back. And why in the – wait a minute. So – Anyway, I'm just uh, with all due respect to those families. That is, like you guys said, it is a great thing. If it's if it is legit as it looks like on the surface, it's a great thing. You know, and, and I was reading an article that was published in the Japan Times, so it wasn't skewed by our media, and it wasn't skewed by the Korean media. It was a Japan Times thing, and it was saying that apparently, um, even through the the last fifty years, there has been somewhat of a coalition between North and South, uh, both sides working together somewhat to try to recover bodies, not just Americans, but any bodies that were found um, and try to identify maybe through uniforms or something that's around the bodies that they can identify maybe what country they came from and all of that. But it is nice to see. And, and yeah, Kim Jong-un is a crazy son of a bitch. We all know that. I still don't trust him as far as I can throw him, which isn't very far because he's kind of a, uh, 
a fatty. But I would say, like I said, uh, any step in the right direction is good. And so far, I think he probably knows, whether you like Trump or not, I think Kim Jong-un knows that Trump kind of means business. And I don't think he wants to piss off Trump or China right now because China is directly tied, at least economically, with the U.S. So it is nice to see that he is trying to help and get at least 158 uh, shipping crates, which there's no telling how many bodies or remains are are in that so uh kudos to him at least trying to get back our heroes and uh i would like to think that we would do the same with other countries if we ever had that kind of a war on our soil so uh, like i said it's good to see that clover you got anything about um north korea doing that or are you ready to move on no i just i'll say that yeah just to echo what everybody else said i mean it's it's pretty awesome that that we get those guys home and i think uh, you know, I would think that there's yeah. probably identifying factors, you know, with most of them. I don't know that the vast majority will require DNA stuff. I mean, they have dog tags and patches and other things. Yeah. Uh, so you've got that. And then on the Trump, uh, Kim thing, I mean, it takes crazy to deal with crazy sometimes. Like that's kind of where we're, we sit with that. That's true. <laughs> Fight fire with fire. That's right. That's right. Uh, Ozzy's out there. We got uh, we got a heavy heavy metal god in here with us. Ozzy's out there. So, uh, well, guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk tonight about something that I'm passionate about, and uh, you know, kind of everyone knows every channel's kind of got a theme to what they do. One of the major things uh, themes of my channel is uh, getting to the range and being more proficient with your firearms. And I'm a big concealed carry proponent. Uh, I personally like to train. Not everybody likes to train. I like the tactical and the strategy side of things, and that might be because of my military background. I don't know, but I kind of like the training aspect. But, uh, you know, there is a difference between practicing and training. We'll get into that in a minute. But tonight we're going to discuss um, basically the difference between training and practicing and what are some good ways to uh, train and practice for real-life scenarios like um, – you know, concealed carry practicing, home defense, self-defense, and and home and self-defense is also different because home defense is basically to your where you're at, whether it's a hotel room or a house or whatever. Self-defense could be out in public at anywhere. So we're going to discuss that. And um, Matt Sexy says just wipe them off the earth. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those that uh, um, I don't think that Kim Jong Un wants to to mess with us right now. Anyways. So before we get going into this, I want to kind of go through the room. I want to start with Clover, and I want to kind of see, you know, what your uh, experience level with actual training is. Do you like to train? Because not everybody does. And then uh, your your perspective on uh, practicing for concealed carry, some help, some uh, self defense, and home defense. So I'm going to start with you first, and kind of let me know what your uh, level of training is. Do you like it or not? Uh, formal training, you know, I've, I've had zero, I've went to no classes. Um, I don't particularly think, I mean, with the amount, I mean, what's the purpose of social media and YouTube videos and, and all of these other things. I mean, look at, uh, uh, look at Pinkus, the stuff online, you know, and all that good stuff with, with everything available out there, as long as you put that stuff into, into practice, take that training and put it into practice. I think that's probably more important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as far as experience with actually going to a training, this is pretty much zero with defensive tactical style training. But, you know, I do. Right. I do. Now, employ, I, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I do, sure. I do a uh, lot. Attack. Of, do What's that? I was just going to say, I, you know, I do a lot of different, you know, run a lot of different scenarios, but I, we'll probably get into those later. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into some differences here. Uh, Tech, I know you uh, have done some training. Do you enjoy it? Um, you know, how do you feel about the training side of things? Um, I've done a lot of training. I continue to do training. I think it's critical. Uh, however, I think we'll get into this at some point, but I think that the old school way of, uh, again, Long story short, military and, and police training just doesn't fit what a civilian defender is going to see in the in the world. It's just not the same. 
you're not clearing rooms, you're not, you know, stacking up and you're not doing those types of tactics in real world civilian defender scenarios. And the truth of the matter is most ranges simply don't allow it. They don't allow you to train the way you need to. They don't allow you to even do something as simple as draw from your holster. That is true. All right. Uh, you're 100% correct about that. And unless you actually are doing a training class, uh, most ranges are maybe possibly very limited to – I know there's a lot of ranges that don't even let you draw. Um, you know, so it is what it is. We'll, we'll talk about some of that differences here in a second. Uh, you got a couple of fanboys out there, Mike. Uh, Bernie Beefcake out here says, I'm just here for Michael Woodland. Yeah, so, I just Boom Outdoors, that. what's going on? Yeah, I just saw that and responded. So, uh, so tell me about know who that is. Yeah, I know that you do training and you actually teach training. Uh, so, obviously, I think you're a proponent of training, but uh, you know, what do you think that the, the positives of training are? Well, the first thing is um, training, that is the aspect of learning something new or adding to your kit bag, as we always say in the military. So you got to have an open mind when you go into the training aspect of things. Um, the learning curve is, um, or practicing rather, is when you're going to go back and reinforce what you learned. So one easy concept we can say is when we teach somebody the, two, the two-stage trigger. All right. So when you get back into your own environment, now you can break it down and work at your own pace and understand it a little bit better or just reinforce it a little bit better. Absolutely. And and we're going to move into this transition is, you know, I like training, but I think that Clover and all three of us would, would agree that, um, you know, training is great because if you're going to training, it means you're trying to learn something new. Okay, you're you're going to a pistol class or even a, even a, a martial arts class. I mean, all of that is training into your self defense, home defense, and all of that because it all is combined into one. Training is where you're going to try to go learn from someone uh, to learn some new skill sets to add to your repertoire. Practice is where you take that training and other stuff that you've learned from other places and actually input it into your uh, your being. Being proficient with your handgun, being proficient with your martial arts or whatever it is, but being able to defend yourself, your loved ones, and other civilians in a you know a self defense or a public place, home defense with your family, anytime you're concealing concealed carry, being proficient is extremely important. So that's where it comes into practice. And I want to kind of talk about some stuff that that I do when I go to the range. And very few times do I ever go to the range, and it's probably been a years since I've gone to the range and just shot just to shoot. I'm going there with different guns that I might be carrying. I might take you know the four or five guns that are in my CCW rotation, and I'm taking all of those guns out there. I'm drawing all of them from concealment. Uh, I'm using, if I have multiple holsters, whether inside the waist or outside the waist, I'm going to go ahead and draw from all those holsters with all those guns. And it might take a long time, but... You know, you have to be able and ready to do that using multiple guns, multiple holsters, whatever you're going to possibly be using and, and, and practice that. And it could be as simple as just drawing and taking two shots, putting it back in the holster, drawing, taking two shots or whatever. But um, what I want to talk about right now is when you are at the range practicing, do you guys have some specific drills that you use um, that talk about? target acquisition or getting multiple rounds into a target or, or shooting from the draw or shooting from cover. Are there any drills in specific that you personally use when you go to the range? And we'll start with Mike this time. Yeah. Um, one of the things I do because I do appendix carry, I focus heavy on that. Okay. So of course, when I first get out to the range, I start off everything slow and it's like, I'm almost talking to myself, you know, grab your shirt, think about your stance, pull it out, you know, go ahead and extend out, make sure I got side alignment, sight picture, everything working in effect, slowly pull the trigger. And then, of course, once I feel comfortable with my slow process, then I start picking it up. And then from there, I start working on whatever I want to work on that day, whether it be transitions or trigger manipulation or just a different or faster way to acquire the sights. Yeah, I like that. Uh, it's, you know, appendix carry... For me, it's uncomfortable. 
Uh, and I think it might depend also kind of on your body style. I, I'm a shorter guy. Um, maybe it just doesn't work for me. But, um, you know, I always say that if you carry appendix, you probably need to do maybe a little bit more practice than if you would carry maybe at the four o'clock or something like that, just because the, this is just for me, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Mike, but for me, if you're appendix carrying, when you make that draw, you're already kind of being put in a weird position with your flying elbow. And when you draw, you know, your, your, your muzzles pointed possibly at your leg or something like that. So there's going to have to be maybe a little bit more practice on making sure your trigger discipline's correct, that you keep, you know, you keep your finger out of the trigger well and all the muzzle control and all of that to where when you do draw in a stressful situation, you don't have an ND that could hit that artery because if you hit an artery in your leg, it could take maybe less than seven seconds and you're dead. So um, is, is that something that you really focus on as the actual draw when you do a Penix carry? Yeah, well, when you appendix appendix carry, the equipment that you use is the most important. So, for instance, um, you know, I'm very big on JM4 Tactical and their new Relic um, holster. But this right here is what I've carried as of recently. And one of my buddies made this for me who lives down in Florence, um, South Carolina. And this is by far the most comfortable setup that I have. And not only does it have the extra magazine, okay. but... It actually fits more comfortable, whereas everything else I wore, it dug into me, made me numb in the area, that little irritable pain. But this one eliminated all that. So you just have to find the right gear that's for you and not necessarily the best name gear. But just go around, do a search, figure out what works for you. And then that's where you should train, you know. Now, one thing you did say is that uh, you know, from the multiple um, nope. um, weapons you draw from with the different holsters. Now, what I try to do is try to set up all my holsters the same way with the same cant and everything. So that one thing is the same, you know. So when I'm pulling, it's not like I'm coming straight down one time and another time I'm coming in at that angle, you know. You know, that's, that's a really good point. And I'm the same way, at least with my inside the waist, with outside the waist, uh, depending upon the, which gun that I'm carrying, um, it might be different depending on the grip angle or whatever of that particular gun. But for the most part, um, when, especially all my inside the waist, all of them are going to, uh, I try to, if they're all able to, and most of them are these days, they're all going to have the same cant to where I know that I can put my hand back there, grab that grip, and it's going to feel the same no matter what holster, what gun it is. So, I think that's a good point is being consistent with your uh, your your holsters. Make sure the cant's at least close to the same to where every time you draw, no matter what gun and what holster it is, it's the same feeling every single time. It's a really, really uh, great point. My bad, Clover. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go to Kevin real quick, and, and um, I, apparently I'm in Clover's head. So um, I don't know. That's, that's a scary place to be. Now, real quick, I want to um, – I'm going to let you guys talk about this. Laggy McLag Lag had a question. He said, being the best at one thing or being good at many? My take is, is being proficient is a lot of different tasks. Uh, I'm going to let Kevin answer that question first, and then I want you to go in and let me know what are some specific things that you try to do when you're at the range and practicing for self-home defense, CCW, whatever. Um. I do a lot of dry fire at home and I've been using the cert pistol quite a bit. And okay. So if I go to the range, I'm just trying to reinforce what skills I've been practicing at home. Smooth draw. I, I don't agree with any of your appendix opinions from earlier. Just one has nothing to do with the other, whether it's appendix or three o'clock or four o'clock. If you train to draw, um, the reason I went appendix is because it was proven to me that it's faster. Yeah, yeah. And, oh shit! I don't think there's fun. anyone that could argue back on that side of it, you know. Well, and again, um, you know, well, go ahead. If I go to the range, or I'm at like an event, or I'm out at a training event thing, and I, you know, I have a battle belt on, it's at three o'clock, so I have to train that way too. But right. for day to day, it's going to be primary weapon appendix. Uh, get that out and defend myself. So the problem, again, at the range is you can't really do all that. So what you're focusing on is, again, all the basics of 
good grip and a front sight and a nice trigger pull and all that fun stuff. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And when it comes, to, I don't think anyone will argue that probably a Pinnix is probably the quickest draw that you could have. And I think it really comes down to if you're comfortable or not. Uh, for me, it, it's not the fact that you got the chicken wing going or whatever. For me, it's just it's physically not comfortable for me to a Penix carry. Um, I've tried it before. Uh, I've actually trained with it before. For me, it was just it feels weird. Now I know Clover. Um, he carries in a couple different places, but uh, you carry in the in, in your back mostly. So, do you have to do a lot of training with your draw? being that it's all the way around back or is that something you practice or exactly what do you practice the most when you're out there trying to get work done not just on an everyday you just got there shooting but when you're actually working on something what are some specific things that you work on well if i carry if i carry what well, you know what i consider deep conceal right then usually it's small of the back um most of right. the time i carry outside waistband but if i got a shirt that covers it so i mean technically that's that's concealed of course if my shirt rides up or something but in the small of my back it's not going to ride up nobody's going to see that so um yeah it's definitely a different thing uh, for me it's going to be slower coming out without a doubt and because of that i tend to when i train i tra tend to train I've got access having your own place at your own house and stuff is great because you can do whatever you want and I get barrels and tires, you know, I've got benches and chairs and I got things I can sit around. Right. And I work on transitional. Um, I'm, I'm looking to find cover while I'm finding cover. I can be drawing or once I get the cover, I can be drawing just depending on the, the scenario that I'm working on. Right. So that helps. And, and most of the time with small on the back, that's going to be the issue. I mean, if, if I don't have time to find cover, you got to do what you got to do, I guess. But, um, you know, the, in the, in a perfect world, you know, I would want to be behind a table, you know, something before I, before I actually, you know, was to draw. Um, what else? I mean, shooting from just different positions is important. I mean, what if you're what if you're on the ground? What if you know they come in and it's everybody down and everybody goes down except for you? Well, you've just identified yourself, right? So, you know, being able to go down and then potentially shoot from the shoot from the ground, shoot laying down or something, would be important. Or you know, shooting underneath the table, even uh, that sort of thing. And that's where having obstacles and different things come into play. You can set that up to where you can drop down and actually shoot from underneath the table. Or even underneath the chair, uh, just something in between you and uh, that perpetrator. You know, uh, get get something in between there. The, Clover, you know, I got a question. Yeah, I was always concerned carrying with the uh, uh, small the back anywhere in the back uh, because, in essence, again, on a slippery day or in a slippery situation, if you fall and land in that area, you could do some damage to your back versus. Mm -hmm. on the side or appendix why did you choose to carry in the back because whenever you're talking about you know a deeper concealment type thing it's more comfortable for me more con yeah it's definitely comfortable no doubt man no doubt about that um i mean the odds i don't know i mean you're right i mean if you was to slip and fall just flat over your back yeah i mean you but... got a big hunk of metal back there and that was always the concern mm -hmm. for me because i have a bad lower back from you know old basketball injuries and shit right well so, i mean i'm 40 something years old my back's not the greatest so i mean i agree but then you know what odds i'm gonna arbitrarily just slip one day and and end up falling absolutely flat on my back true you know? without so, bracing yourself yeah without catching yourself or you know rolling to the side or you know something something along that line so you know we talk we talk about odds all the time and i just don't think you know, for me, and everybody's got to make that decision. Of course, again, I go back into, for me, carrying small of the back is, is more of a deep concealed situation. That's not every day. Uh, you know, I carry, you know, like I said, four o'clock or so position um, outside waistband under my shirt 99% of the time. But, you know, for those times that I am going to carry small of my back, I mean, you still got to train. And you still got to practice with that. It's a, it's a totally different situation you're not gonna be able to react the same and to, to echo what mike had said earlier too about doing things slow um, yeah i always do that even if i'm doing something that i'm barely proficient at um 
you know, when you first get out on the range, go through those fairly slow a couple of times because you can you can get a little bit of an adrenaline rush. It's fun to, to put lead down the range. I mean, let's be honest. And so you can get that little adrenaline rush sometimes. And I had that happen one time that I went out there all gung-ho and just started running through stuff. And I was doing the whole push-off drill, you know, kind of slap face with the left hand at the same time you draw and ended up putting a shot about – an inch away from my finger and my thumb i didn't get my left hand back uh quick enough and i'm like okay well that's a timing thing you know i need to work on this a whole lot slower and get it down so i always work on that uh slow first when i'm doing you no know, not just that but any drill work on it on it slow first and then speed up as i go yeah patrick out there saying that it's called my appendix carry uh, saying it's the most comfortable to carry, and it seems to him that he's able to draw faster and have better control indexing and getting a quick sight picture. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there there is no right or wrong answer on how to carry. Uh, for you, it's got to be comfortable, especially if you're carrying every day. It's something that's got to be comfortable to you. Um, it's got to be easily accessible. And like you said, getting a quick sight picture, getting the muzzle down and aimed quickly is we're talking split seconds or the matter of life and death. So whatever it works for you. Hey, what's up, Clint? Um, he got in this thing about not shooting his junk. Well, you know, uh, that's, that is part of appendix carry is, is you better have some pretty good trigger discipline. And, um, when you're doing, especially under stress and, and making it that quick, uh, for me personally, when I go to the range, I like to do a lot of different, uh, drills. I'll do, you know, El Presidente, Mozambique. There's all those great drills that have been out there forever. But the biggest thing that I try to do is draw, get a quick sight picture, get a couple shots off. I like to go multiple targets. Um, chances are you may only, if you ever are involved in a shooting, it might be one-on-one, -on -one, but what if you've got two or three? So uh, I like to do maybe two or three and going back and forth and you know, multiple target acquisition and, and trying to figure out how to shoot from cover, moving to cover. Uh, learning the difference between cover and concealment. Concealment can help you, but you don't want to stay there very long. Learning to shoot on the move, guys, because I promise you this. If you're in a self-defense shoot situation and you're standing still, that's not going to work out well for you. So you always want to be moving. You always want to be moving from point A to, from point A cover to point B cover. Uh, obviously, if you want to try to get away, that's going to save your life as well. But if you don't have the option to get away, learn how to use cover. I think you also have to realize that there is something to be said about being proficient at changing magazines. Um, if you do carry an extra mag in your belt or wherever, like Mike does in his holster, um, learn how to make sure you're getting proficient at that, you know, changing your mag from slide lock. Um, be, this is one thing that most people don't ever do. Please learn how to be proficient in handling malfunctions, whether it's a double feed or a misfeed or a failure to fire. Please learn how to understand how to clear the gun and get back into that fight. A lot of times, uh, one of the great things you can do is when you're loading up your magazine, throw in just a snap cap or uh, an empty um, brass cartridge or something in there to simulate uh, some sort of malfunction. There's all sorts of things you can do to simulate malfunctions, but if you've never practiced that and you get in a real world situation and all of a sudden you're faced on having a misfeed or a double feed or a failure to fire and you've never really practiced that, that that's going to be a dangerous situation. So, you know, uh, be on the lookout for all sorts of different things to practice, not just working on the draw, but move the, move the draw, uh, work on move, taking from the draw, but on the move, moving to get to cover, uh, whether you're sh moving backwards or forwards or diagonally, there's all sorts of different movements and, and learn how to shoot from behind cover. Um, I do slap, tack and rack. That's right. Uh, that, that'll get most of them. If you have a malfunction, that's not going to get done with uh, slap rack and uh, tap and rack, then, uh, run and get out of there and live to fight another day. There was a question up here. Uh, Mad Sexy says he has one. How to inform a police officer that you have a gun concealed on you or locked in the trunk? Uh, are you talking about, Sexy, are you talking about when if you get pulled over? Because uh, in Arkansas, and I would say in a lot of cases, in most states, 
uh what's up patriot what's uh, i would say in a lot of states um but I know in Arkansas, if you get pulled over and you have a concealed carry permit, first of all, they're going to run your license plate and they're going to know um, that you that you at least have a license to carry. Um, I would say that even if your state doesn't mandate it, I would sit there and say when they ask you for your license, I would have your license and your permit. I would very politely give them and say, officer, just want to let you know ahead of time for your safety and mine that I am licensed to carry and I am armed. And uh, most of them will sit there and say, thank you very much. They might ask where it is. By all means, tell them where it is, but please do not try to take it out and point it and show it to them. They don't need to see it. They just want to know where it is and yeah. keep your hands yeah. away from that area. Uh, in Texas, Clover, real quick, we'll go with you real quick. In Texas, are you required to uh, let them know that you have uh, a license to carry and you are armed? No, not anymore. Okay. You know, but yeah, right, you're, you're, if you can pull them I mean, up, do you at least notify them that you yeah, are carrying? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm going to. Here, here's the thing. Be nice. But I, I get it. I mean, whether they're, you know, we have situations where law enforcement officers, there are those out there, they overstep their bounds, they're having a bad day, they're pricks. I get it, okay? But at the end of the day, they've got the upper hand, regardless. So be polite, be honest, no sudden movement. Yes. Hands where they can see them. I mean, these are no-brainer things. Just turn your, sure. if it's nighttime, yeah. turn your lights on inside the car so they yeah, can see the up, whole. Turn, uh, at least uh, overhead, yeah, whatever the little uh, whatever yeah. they're called, turn trim lights or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something on. Um, and you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never had a problem. Usually, when I, I tell them that, usually it's on me, right? And they'll ask right. me to get out. You know. Um, I guess because they don't want it because I'm sitting, it's more or less, you know, maybe I don't, I don't know. I don't get it. But most of the time they'll ask me to get out. We'll walk to the rear of the vehicle. And that's probably so the camera can film it. Right. Sure. And they usually just say, just don't take it out. Don't reach for it. <laughs> like, okay. That's easy enough. You know, I don't make it a habit to you know, <laughs> reach for my firearm when I'm getting pulled over don't, you don't with it when you're walking somewhere. You know, not a problem. And I've already got my wallet out at that point because that's your number one move when you get pulled over. Pull that wallet out, set it on the dash, you know, wh whatever. That way you're not reaching around, you know, uh, looking like you you might be about to do something nefarious. You know, go ahead and have that stuff out and ready to go because when they pull you over, you're right. Uh, they've done run your, your plates. They pretty much know who you are and and everything else. So unless you do something you know, unless you have done something, you know, in the past, and that's why they pulled you over. There's some kind of bench warrant and they're looking for you. Um, you know, unless it's something like that or you just do something blatantly stupid, you know, it's, you know, worst case, it's going to end with a ticket, right? Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of cops, like I said, if, if you have a permit and they pull your license up, they're going to know pretty much ahead of time that you at least have a license to carry or a permit to carry. Oh, like you said, and most, you uh, most states... Yeah, most states, What's I mean, up? they're going to know, most states, they're going to know through registration and all that being tied in when they run your license before they oh, ever get out of the car. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if they come up to your window and you don't even mention your permit, you don't mention a gun, they're going to wonder, this guy's hiding something or, you know, why isn't he being open about it? They're well, going to start getting a little weary about it. Maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily think they will, but again, you, you always run the risk of getting that one cop on a bad day. You know, he, yeah. he, he left that morning right. he was fighting with his wife or, you know, was having problems with his, you know, teenage son or whatever's going on. Cop, you know, law enforcement officers are people. Okay. I, I agree. They should be held to a, a higher standard because of what they do and some other things. But at the end of the day, they're people. They face all the things that regular people face and they get frustrated and everything else that happens. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily um, subscribe to the idea. If you don't tell them it's going to, it's going to end badly, but it's, it's not going to end badly. I don't think if you do tell them, you know, that was just a courtesy you were offering. them. Yeah. Uh, now, Kevin in Florida, uh, I think Boone says maybe in Florida you don't have the uh, you don't have to tell them that you have uh, a, a permit or you're carrying. But uh, do you make a habit? I don't know if you've been pulled over or not, but do you make it a habit of at least notifying them out of respect or, or what's your take on that? Oh yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. Making sure that they know that I know that they know and all that stuff. So 
yeah, if, if you want to, <clears throat> people want to play tough and talk about, you know, I don't have to tell them this or, you know, they're like, okay, go ahead. Don't see how your day goes. Uh, right. Like, yeah. It's just something that they kind of have the power. And, you know? and, and, and this is this is a state where you do need to tell people, from what I understand. I could be wrong, but I've I've always thought it was okay. one of the. Uh, I thought I saw Boom. I might have misread it, but I think Boom said maybe you, you don't have the duty to notify in Florida. I might have misread it. It was a while ago. Well, I apologize if I misread it. It's state by state. We know that for sure, um, and and that's where you got to be careful, right? Anybody needs yeah. to make sure that they're careful. Well, yeah, uh, being careful and and being respectful. And, and like I said, they're out there talking in the chat right now about interaction. And that's the whole thing is, is you want to be safe. You want to feel safe. That law enforcement officer wants to be safe, wants to feel safe. So if having that dialogue right off the bat before they even say anything, it's officer just want to let you know I have a permit to carry and I am armed. And you get that out of the way. There's a good chance, hopefully, that that rest of that traffic stop goes in a much better situation because everyone feels safe. So, you know, and if they maybe, ask you to get out of the car, whether you with it or whether you believe that it's right or not, just get out of the car and, and, and help that situation. Because if you fight it, then, like you said, there's going to be some issues. Just do what they ask you to do and let them do their thing. What well, are we going to say, Clover? You want to put the control in their hands. You can real simply just ask once you once you inform them. Say. What would you like me to do? And then right away they go, okay, yeah, exactly. This guy's asking me what he wants me to do. He's being compliant. He wants to comply. He wants to make sure that, you know, uh, everything That's is a great point. You know, so, you know, if you ask them, then you acknowledge that they have control at that point. So they're going to feel more in control. Depending on what state you live in and yeah. what your gun laws are, I would think that you would really probably want to talk to local authorities about what your protocol should be. And you should really probably have that set up before you put a car into play with your with your gun. Well, if we talking about um, notifying the officers, how about the same thing we talked about when you can still carry of having everything um, consistent, regardless of where you are? Just notify the officer that you have a weapon on you. There's no harm, no foul. Yeah, that, that mean yeah, exactly. I mean, it, say in South Carolina, or do you have the duty to uh, notify, Mike? Yes, you have to notify in South Carolina. I do know it's a felony um, if you don't notify the officer. Really, it's a felony. Wow. Yeah, so right. that. Just by that is, is if you don't notify and that's a felony, you could literally lose your right to carry in South Carolina because you could be charged with a felony. So if you're in South Carolina, night strike in Ellis, make sure you notify if you get pulled over. Oh, yeah. So now, um, let's the, see, local, like, and the different ways of um, how you should um, when a cop approaches you when you get pulled over or whatever. Like you said, I turn the lights on. I, I open up all the windows. I take one hand and put it out the sunroof. The other hand, I got my my wallet or um, my CCW, my driver's license, all that information. I pass it off. But as soon as the cop gets in earshot, that's the first thing I say is like, hey, I got a concealed carry. I have the gun in here. The gun is under the seat, under my leg, on my hip, wherever it is. I let them know. A local out there is talking to these guys. He says, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that. Go ahead. Well, he's saying screw getting out. He says he's, he's asking for a sergeant. Well, the, the problem with that, it, at least around here where I live, is a lot of times when people get pulled over, you get pulled over in such a way that it's very, very dangerous for that officer standing there beside your, your window. And that's usually why they're asking you to get out and go to the, to the rear of the vehicle. Most times it's because you, you're able to get further off the road that way. Um, you know, somebody coming by there's, there's laws here in Texas to where if you pass uh, law enforcement, they have somebody, you know, they're doing a stop that you're to move into the far left-hand lane. You're supposed to slow down all this other stuff. Do you think people follow those traffic guidelines or whatever? No, they don't. So, I mean, it's, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. Maybe you live in a place to where your law enforcement officers are, you know, complete boneheads and do nothing but harass people. But, um, for the most part in my travels, uh, I don't, I don't see that. I mean, they're trying to do things as safe and by the book and by protocol as, as they can. 
and I don't I don't see a problem with complying with that. No, no. Um, whether it's whether it's a, a criminal charge or not, like I said, that the best thing that you can do if you get pulled over while you're carrying, uh, whether it's on your person or in a lockbox or you know wherever it may be in the car, notify them, let them know. And I like the idea. Remember who said it earlier, but asking them, what would you like for me to do? And if they ask you to get out, you know, local out there, Clay said that he he won't get out of the car. Last for a sergeant. That's your prerogative. And uh, it's one of those things. But if, if, if you want to make it a safe environment, a uh, respectful in, uh, conversation, me personally, if he asked me to get out of the car um, and he feels safer out of the car, then I'm probably going to get out of the car, talk to him, and I'm going to get my car and head out. That's on you. Just make sure that you're in a safe environment. Both parties are feeling safe and all of that. So uh, Grim Reapers out there, he said, y'all started without me. Dude, you're almost an hour late, so I, I waited as long as I could. But uh, I'm sorry, brother. Um, all right, before we move on to the uh, the last topic, real quick, I, I am going to take our next uh, public service announcement. So here we go. Hey, Ghost Squad, this is Sky. Hey, Oops. Ghost Squad, this is Sky. We here at Ghost Tactical would like to continue the trend of becoming more involved in any gun safety and training. We encourage everyone, no matter your skill level, to continuously look for training in your local area. We think that taking a gun safety course every other year is important. We also believe that taking classes and training for self-defense and home defense are extremely important. Make sure to go looking for classes and training opportunities when you can. This not only helps you become more proficient with your firearm, but it helps support your local instructors and Second Amendment community as a whole. Back to you, Ghost. Right on. So the last thing we're going to talk about real quick, guys, is um, Clint says he likes to start with what's your name and badge number. You know, that's that's on you, bro. If you want to go that route, then uh, have fun with that traffic stop. Uh, most of the time, they'll have their name badge and their badge number on their badge. So you probably around don't have to they, ask. Too. Around here, they identify when they walk up. I don't exactly. know if that's, that's, that's all or what. But they always identify. I'm Officer So-and-So with So-and-So Department. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, if you want to start out doing that, then hey, brother, you have fun with that traffic stop. Chances are you're probably not going to get a warning, just saying. Uh, no, but we're going to move on real quick to the last topic. And it's transitioning from practicing at the range to maybe probably practicing at home. Whether or not you have a home range or not, we're going to take all ranges at once. We're talking about going home and practicing and doing some training at the house, whether it's dry firing whether it's working on um, a single man room clear, trying to get from bedroom A to bedroom B where your kids are or whatever, or getting the entire family involved with an active shooter inside the house. Everyone kind of knows, kind of like a fire drill. Everyone kind of knows where to go, what to do. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with Mike this time and say, uh, do you do, obviously, I think everybody, everybody probably does some dry firing at home, but do you ever work on tactics inside the house with you or the family at all? All the time. Um, but you got to remember, too, I'm single and um, I have my daughter like every so often. So I don't do right. the drills with her, but she does know if something's not right, where she's supposed to go hide it. And I'm going to come there and give the secret knock or say the secret word to her. Um, a lot of what I do in the house when it comes to practicing is a lot of low light and no light training. So if you can walk around your yep. house in the complete darkness, you already have the upper hand because you know where everything is, you know? So of course, you know, you, you flash a light where you think somebody is, turn it off, move to the next spot, wherever you're going to prearrange everything and um, take into account what is around your house and how you're going to maneuver. And you make up two great points there and we'll discuss them here in a little bit. Uh, first of all is maybe a safe word. Um, or some sort of vocabulary that only you and your family know, you know, what code reds or whatever your safe word would be. Um, we have safe words at my household. And, you know, if my daughter's home for the weekend and she comes in with her friends at two o'clock in the morning, I hear that little buzzer when the door or window opens on the alarm system. Um, I hear that she's got about 10 seconds to say a safe word. If not, 
uh, things are getting ready to get hairy. So I love the whole vocabulary and safe word issue. The second thing I love that you talked about is the lighting issue. Um, like you said, you know your house better than anybody else. So the more lights that you have on inside that house only diminishes your tactical, I don't know how you would put it, but your, your advantage probably is the best way to say it, your tactical advantage. If you're able to uh, maneuver around your house with zero to a little bit of light on there, you most definitely have the advantage over an intruder because they don't know the layout of your furniture, where the rooms are. You know, there might be shortcuts here and there. So I think that's a, an awesome thing to try, uh, practice is practicing in low light. And if you can do it without using a light yourself, because for me, I'm not saying if you use a light on your firearm or in your hand, by all means do it. But for me in a home situation, I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to use a light as much as possible until maybe the very last second I'm trying to identify. Uh, you can kind of see shadows. You can see the mount, make the outlines. But if you're using a light, you're giving your position away. That's just my thoughts. Uh, now, Kevin, I want to bring you in on this because you actually just put a video with code reds and safe words and all that stuff with your daughter at the, at the high school and at home. And you talk about going with your gut and all that. So I'm assuming that your family is at least uh, discussed safe words. They've discussed... Uh, plans on active shooters inside the home or whatever. Do you guys actively practice those things? That's OPSEC information. Okay. I apologize. Uh, no, I did I, not have the you can assume, I'm just joking. You can, assume, you can assume so. I can assume that you're doing something, yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I don't again, want to go into particulars, you but... You mentioned something, and I mentioned something at the talk the other night. It's like, it's the fire drill. It's like... At a classroom full of people, and I said, "So, how many people notice the one tool that we can all share and use in here in case we have an emergency?" And you know, a couple people realized what I was talking about. For the most part, you go into a public place and you assume that if something happens, you can be able to pretty much look around, and eventually, you're going to find a fire extinguisher, and you're going to know how to use it. And you're going to know how to use it. It's pretty simple how to use a fire extinguisher, right? Right. And but my point is, it's because someone actually has handed you one and shown you how to do it before, you know, or you've looked at it or you've inspected it <clears throat> at home. Right. Every, everyone knows that there's a small fire. Go grab that little fire extinguisher and we'll take care of business. The next level would be what? Right. Get everyone out of the house. Call 911. Grab whatever's super important if it really looks like it's going to go down and get out of the house. Right. So similarly, Correct. Um, what I didn't. It, what I didn't put on the one video and I, I have it somewhere so I have to go get it, but for what you're talking about, um, it, for me, it goes back even further. If you're serious about your castle and protecting it, you know, I'm about the sixth or seventh thing bef that a bad guy with bad intent would have to mm -hmm. make a, decision in his head oh yeah i'm gonna violate that sign that i see there i'm gonna violate how well lit this house is i'm gonna violate those good locks i'm gonna violate that dog that sounds pretty damn ferocious and angry about the fact that i'm not gonna shake in the door and then by the time there yeah. i'm gonna have to deal with that dog whatever then you deal with that dog now you got a flight of steps to come up you get you know yep so yes there is a protocol for no, you're everybody right. else while all that's going on sure yeah, you make it make it extremely inconvenient for somebody first. It goes goes back to the old yeah. adage about the old adage about you know locks. All locks do is keep an honest man honest, right? So you know? right. it turns out it turns out I got some data and in Parkland last year in in 2017 there was nine. What did he say? Ninety seven cars got stolen. Ninety six of them had the fob in the car. Really? And I was like, so literally people jumped in the car and pushed the button and took off. And they're like, yep. <laughs> yep. No keys needed. <laughs> uh, now, Clover, where you live, you might be in a little bit different situation than, let's say, Tack Daddy, uh, who probably lives in a more of an urban area. You've got land. You've got a, a driveway that's kind of a one way in and one way out. So the chances are of people actually getting inside your house uh, might be a little bit slimmer than they would maybe in Florida. So I'm assuming that you probably have some precautions out in the yard or whatever. You don't get into those. But do you ever practice on 
if you see some lights or if you're alerted that someone's out in the front yard, do you have anything that you do or do you let them get inside the house? I mean, you know, like I said, with people that have yeah, land yeah. and wood and areas and all that, there's different areas that you have to practice. Yeah, it's it would be not that it, it couldn't happen, but it would be, you know, we talk about inconveniencing the criminal mind. And, you know, with having a dog yeah. with, you know, being such a long driveway, basically one way in, one way out. My driveway is pretty rough, so vehicles are going to make noises or coming down, squeaking and what else, whatever else. Right. Uh, not that they couldn't drop somebody off out at the highway and somebody walk, but anything they stole, they would have to tote. So, I mean, I don't pursue that That's right. either. That's not really realistic. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you, there's noises and things that happen at night, obviously that happen outside and I have outbuildings, right? Now, most of those outbuildings, except for one, I guess, uh, that really doesn't have much in it. Uh, most of those stay locked, but again, you go back to locks, keep it honest, man, honest, they could kick in a door or whatever. <laughs> Um, and usually with the dog, I mean, the dog is going to bark if they hear anything outside anyway, and the dog barking, a lot of times you're, you're not going to hear that from the outside. So that would alert me. I would be able to get up, kind of check things out. Yeah. I have a series of, I actually go to windows in other rooms usually first, um, because I've got, there's a couple of windows and then the, um, uh, the French doors and I'm able to actually look out the out those at certain angles and see the outbuildings uh, do that without turning on lights obviously and I've got night lights that come on after dark outside so it's fairly lit up outside and it's dark in the house so they're not going to see me seeing them um, so usually I can check everything out pretty well without actually having to even leave the house which is pretty neat They're talking about out here uh, alarms and motion lights surrounding the house, uh, barking dogs. Yeah, all of those things are, are great. You know, you're talking about deterrence and use all the deterrence you can. Like, like you're saying, a well-lit yard, um, you know, dogs that bark, alarm systems, you know, all of that stuff are great. But if someone wants to get inside that house, those things aren't going to deter them. They're not going to scare them away. If they really went inside that house, they're going to get inside, inside that house. So you need to be able to practice all of this stuff. Um, what I would say before we start cleaning the room up and getting out of here um, is the most important thing is just being proficient. And whatever you're able to do, whatever you're comfortable doing, whether you're not, you involve your family um, or the people that live in that house, your roommates or whatever, involve them into your practicing the most important thing, guys, is do as much as you can with as much time as you have to and be proficient as much as you can because the last thing you want to have is the first time you've ever practicing this stuff is real world because, you know, understand that you can practice this all you want, but until you get that uh, adrenaline rush before you get that freaked out because you can do it all day long, but until you're in actual fear for your daughter or your son's life in that room next door because you have an intruder, you're not really sure how you're going to react. Um, I, I, I used to say that a lot of times in the Marine Corps, we used to do push-ups and jumping jacks and sit-ups for at least two or three minutes to get our heart rate up and get a break of sweat before we start doing any shooting and, and doing all this stuff because – you have to have that accelerated heart rate. You have to have that adrenaline rush before you really understand what your body can or can't do in that situation. So try to make it as real as possible. Dry fire all you can, even if it's at the house. If you're watching the ball game, you know, make sure obviously the gun is clear, the mag's out, and everyone's safe. But, you know, practice drawing from your, you know, from concealment and getting locked in on that target picking up your front sight, getting quick target acquisition. If you've got a TV show, you know, you get two or three people in that scene, draw, kind of aim in at all three of those characters. That's that's picking up, you know, multiple target acquisition. All of that stuff helps. It sounds crazy, but you can kill more than one bird with, with one stone. Watch TV, enjoy it, but get some work in because the more proficient you're going to be is the better you have to survive, your family surviving, and anyone else in that area surviving. Um, you know, mad sexy good, out there says string up. Go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say that's a good point. What you mentioned about 
you know, heart rate and all of that. And that goes into training in general. Um, you know, don't just go out and train on beautiful, pretty days. I mean, do it in the rain, do it in the freezing cold, do it in the hundred and, you know, the three digit heat, um, night at night with strobe lights at night with car lights, you know, switch all of that up because that's, that sort of helps prepare your mind and, and your body for whatever the elements might be that you're in. It, it increases that stress level a little bit. Uh, Booms had to kick his kid in the butt for keep leaving the doors unlocked. Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be some areas that are very much safe uh, or a lot safer than others. And some people do get in the habit of uh, leaving their doors unlocked or whatever. So just be in the mindset of you never know what's going to happen. You never know who's out there. Um, they're out there saying that thermals help. Yeah, thermals help. I don't know. Not everyone can can afford a thermal uh, optic though. So um, that that then again, you know, I'm not one of those people that will tell you that I think that an optic um, is good for home defense or self defense. I think that the most you probably want to use is maybe a little red dot inside the house. Um, you know, a thermal optic. That's 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 a lot for a, a thirty foot shot. <laughs> just saying, maybe you know, maybe if you're just using it to see the thermal signature. Go for it. Um, well, but, uh, it. That's just me. So for scanning around outside, for you scanning, know, yeah. for scanning, it's like, great. Something like a thermal is pretty cool because I mean, you hear something or whatever. I don't mean how many times I've grabbed that, but I'll grab and it's on quick disconnect, and you know, it stays off the rifle honestly more than it stays on because I just I'll use it as a monocular and and then just uh you know open you know open the window crack the door whatever look out and most of the time it's a possum or a coon or a you know armadillo yep. or stray cat or you know something like that that the dog sparked at but you know without the thermal i wouldn't be able to see it or a rabbit we have rabbits really bad and the dog likes to bark at those sometimes yeah. <laughs> i'm had sexy stop reading mine um yeah so guys what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh we're going to go start kind of doing some plugs and kind of uh, sweeping the floor up as Clover likes to say, we're going to start with Mike, Mike, go ahead and plug your channel. Any projects you got going on? I know you got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming on. I love having you on the show and uh, plug away, my man. Oh yeah. I appreciate it. Um, first things first, um, off of the advice of you and um, Clover, I went ahead and got on gun streamer and um, what's that? Uh, Guntube.org. So if you go to Gunstreamer, you can oh, find me under. Yeah, if you go to Gunstreamer, you can find me under Munitions Weapons Tactical, all spelled together. Guntube.org is M-W Tactical, and um, if anything else, go right here and um, donate, donate to our cause where we can get some cops through um, some jujitsu training, get some um, kids through some um, training free to the parents, and actually get more people involved into the community talking about voting. All right. Also, um, the 21st of July, we're bringing Kevin Dixie out here to Columbia, South Carolina for his Aiming for the Truth program. And we're actually auctioning off some scopes. So this right here is the Bushnell variable scope. Comes with the mount, um, one by six um, optic with the LaRue mount already on it. So this is ready to mount onto your firearm and ready to shoot. For the pre uh, precision junkies out there, we got the Mark IV Leopold um, long range with the TMR reticle. This actually comes with the Kestrel. And if you go to m-wtactical.com, you can get a raffle ticket. The Leopold with the Kestrel is $50. The Bushnell is $30. And we got various options of how you can buy it once you go to the website. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Good. Uh, like I said, thank you for all that you're doing in your community. Uh, being a positive role model and a positive inspiration in your community is what we all strive to be. So uh, thanks for all that you're doing. Hey, uh, uh, Kevin, you. I know that you're a big part of your community right now. Thanks for uh, coming on as always, my brother. And uh, what you got going on? It's not like you wear any hats or anything. I'm, uh, I'm playing Battlefield. I'm waiting for my brother. Uh so I'll be streaming live, I'm sure, at some point. No, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to get a game going with my brother here because he's uh, he's got my parents in town, so I'm trying to save him from the oh brutality. So you're, you're um, playing uh, wing, huh? 
Nah, I'm just, I'll see if I can get them on. But uh, yeah, no, just uh, got a couple videos coming up. Like I said, got some coverage coming up from the um, the uh, Active Killer event in Minnesota on uh, on the Funker Tactical channel very soon. So make sure you're checking that out. Appreciate the invite. Appreciate you guys. Have a good night. You too, bud. Clover, what you got going on, my brother? Um, got Wednesday night show. Thursday night show, Friday night show. What are you going to do now that the brackets are over? Holy uh, cow. Uh, Whatever gonna, are we going to do? We're going to actually have to talk about <laughs> stuff that matters. Thank uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hashtag bracket mania. Those helped out some people, though. I know for a fact. I got emails Absolutely. and other things. I know for a fact because I've been, you know. The viewers like them uh, for the most part. I've gotten some very positive feedback on a couple of brackets that we did. And yeah, I've got I know not. I know brackets aren't for everybody, but the whole point of the bracket is to give multiple options on multiple things to help people out there. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it, it sparks a, It definitely has sparked conversations. People would email me, "Hey, I'm looking at this, and that was mentioned on the bracket. And what do you think? And they've got it for this price." And Fake news. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> says, says the bud daddy, but okay. Whatever. There's a troll. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Go to a shotgun range, Kevin. Please, please. Leave us alone. So, hashtag all fuds all the time. <laughs> hashtag sweet 16. What's up, Shane Hopkins. What's up, Shane? How you doing, bro? Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, so, least, yeah. We at, least get the final, at least get the final four sponsored next time. You know uh, someone that might want to sponsor that? <coughs> Funker Tactical. <coughs> Sorry. Um, what were you saying? <laughs> right. <laughs> Mad Sexy says, Tack Daddy is 19. He sounds extremely young. Uh, he's actually 83 years old. He's just had vocal cord surgery, so he sounds younger. The dude is 83 years old. I've been a ninja for 74 years. <laughs> he looks, you know, he does look younger on video than he does in person. I've he noticed does. that. No, that's, that's the true. I, he I'm also looks yeah. I've got to wonder with the videos he put up, he's put up lately, who his makeup artist is. I mean, he need to hire her because filters, <laughs> filters. Yeah, I want to know what kind of camera he uses. Honestly, there you go. Instead of adding uh, ten pounds, it takes away ten years. No, hold on. I noticed. I noticed that your lighting is exceptional tonight, Ghost. You got some new lighting setup going on. Uh, and I just actually brought it closer, actually. Um, it was kind of off, and I just kind of brought it a little bit closer. He's Don't got his, he's got his uh, everyday carry flashlight duct taped to the top of the That's monitor right. there. That, that is my my streamlight um, everyday carry flashlight just right there in front oh, of me. Oh, I thought you brought your tanning bed in and just opened it up. <laughs> Man, I told you not to say anything about that. God. You know, it is what it is. Um, the, the It's out. The secret's out. I tan. Uh, no, you know, some people, a lot of girls like tall, dark, and handsome. You know, with me, I'm short, pale, and average. Uh, I don't tan. I burn, then peel. Uh, repeat, burn, and peel. Repeat, you know, so it's one of those things. He says, am I joking? No, uh, yes, I am joking, Mad Sexy. Uh, <laughs> Tack Daddy is not 83 years old. Um, he's a couple years older than I am. I'll just say that. Not much. He's a little bit older than I am. So uh, he is younger than 50. I'll put it that way. I'm 46 and proud. I didn't want to say it. I didn't know if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, you can no, do the math. But, uh, no, the tanning bed is real. Uh, the, the tanning bed is real. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I have never tanned. I, don't, I, I can't afford a tan. I, I freaking peel everything off, you know. Uh, anyways, guys, I want to appreciate you guys. Like I said, go check out all these guys uh, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook, on their websites. Go check them all out. They're putting some awesome stuff out there. Uh, you've got, uh, if you want to come and check me out, obviously you know where I'm on YouTube. I'm also on GunStreamer. I'm on GunTube. I'm on Instagram, on Facebook, on Podbean, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on pretty much anywhere that will have me, I'm on. Um, I've been kicked off a couple platforms, but that's okay. Um, it is what it is. Um, but no, you can check me out. Go check out the website, ghosttactical.us. You can find the links to all of my endeavors over there. I appreciate you guys always watching. Go train, go practice. You've got 24 hours, guys, to to make sure that your voices are heard in the ATF comment period on bump stocks and rate of fire and all that stuff. Go to gunowners.org 
or the Firearm Policy Coalition. If you go to gunowners.org, go to the top, it says take action. There is a link that will literally take you to the comment section. So uh, make sure you get out there, have your voices heard. Please turn your cameras on. If you're thinking about being um, a part of the community, turn your cameras on, turn your microphones, become part of the solution. Be part of the gun community. We need all the voices that we could possibly get. Thank you guys for watching and listening as always. If you're watching this in replay or if you're listening to it on the podcast, if you have any questions at all, please email them to live at ghosttactical.us. I really appreciate you guys jumping on. Thank you for watching. We will see you soon. Semper Fi.